Our scripture this morning is going to be found in the 12th chapter of Romans, and then I'll I'll use a couple other passages as we um, focus on leveraging our gifts for the kingdom this morning. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to please follow along. If you don't, the the scripture will be up here on the screen. And uh, this morning, I would ask uh, that you will actually read it together. We're going to do verse 4 through the first part of, of verse 6. So would you please stand and let's just read God's word together. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. Thank you. Would you please be seated? Thank you. Lord, I pray this morning as I prepare to, uh, to deliver this message that you will speak to me, speak through me, and speak in spite of me to those people that you've brought here this morning. You have, you've drawn them unto yourself, and I pray that you'll accomplish what you desire to accomplish this morning. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. We're on part three of our series of uh, our kind of the stewardship, give as God gives deal. And I just wanted to remind you where we've been. We started at um, just a very simple message that said, everything we have and everything we are belongs to God. And then last week, we, we kind of focused just specifically on time, that our time belongs to God. And not just what we have left over, but, but all of it. And uh, if we start with the kingdom of values Everything else seems to be, to be able to fall into place and, and given to us. So today, we're going to focus specifically on gifts, leveraging our gifts for kingdom purposes. And so to get started this morning, you know me, I've always got to have a prop. I, uh, I brought a couple of gifts, and i just share them with you. This is kind of a West thing, but, uh, and you know, in our family, there, there's a sacred rite of passage for men. And every Father's Day and, and every Christmas and birthday, there's a certain gift. If you're a man in the West family that you are honored to have, and, and I wanted to share that with you this morning. It's a very special, kind of expensive deal. It's a bag of M&M peanuts. <laughs> you know, if, if, you, if you graduate into manhood in our family, this is a staple that you get every Father's Day and Christmas, and it's just a, a sign of appreciation from the family and the fact that they... We're kind of last minute. What do we get them? Uh, you know, a gift like this is not really all that great for me um, because I'll eat the whole thing and uh, just adds to my waistline. Um, probably the best thing I can do with a gift like this is put it in a bowl and, and let the whole house dig in and, and share it. But that's, that's just one kind of gift I wanted to, to share with you this morning. Um, another kind of gift is, uh, is this chainsaw. This chainsaw has seen a lot of a lot of miles, and uh, you know a chainsaw is is not the kind of gift you give to somebody so that they can devour it or or really enjoy it. To be honest with you, uh, this gift is given to be used, and about the time you start using this thing, you're going to be hot and sweaty and covered in dirt, and you know it's a little risky because um, if you don't really know what you're doing with it, you can cut your leg off. Um, that's a story for a different a different day, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, this, this is a, a dangerous but vital tool, and it can make a big difference around your house, or if you heat your house with wood like I used to, you know, you spend a lot of time with this in your hands, but in the hands of a volunteer following a, a major hurricane or a tornado disaster, uh, this, this little thing can be a tool of hope. And I just want you to keep that in your mind. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Um, another gift is, uh, is a guitar. Now, just seriously, how many of you at some point or another, uh, received a guitar as a gift because you said you really wanted to play guitar and it kind of stayed in your attic indefinitely? <laughs> All right, thank, thank you for your honesty. That, that's really great. You know, this, this is a gift of potential, isn't it? Because in order for you to really be able to, to utilize this gift, you're going to have to learn a little bit of, of music theory and you're, you're going to have to practice and learn a, learn a skill and it's going to hurt your fingers for a while to, uh, to get to the point where where you're any good with it. And, and the thing is, is that a guitar can bring great joy to the person who, who's playing it, the music that it produces. But, 
more than anything, you know, in the hands of a, of a Jeff Martin, it becomes a, an instrument by which we, we can really magnify God. And so it's, it's got tremendous potential, but it's, it's a, a gift with potential. And, and that's really what it will remain unless it's developed. And then uh, I have one final gift that I'm kind of embarrassed to share with you this morning, but I will. Now, I just want you to know that this gift, to me, seemed like the perfect Mother's Day gift. <laughs> and uh, I gave it to my wife last May, in, in Mother's Day. And, um, I mean, I think it's, it's awesome. It's a, it's a George Foreman's grill. <laughs> I mean, I just don't... Guys, I mean, you're hearing me, right? I mean, I don't understand why... Uh, it's not open, but it's, it's not, it's, it's not open, and it's never been open, and, you know, <laughs> may never be open. So, this is the unopened gift, and we're going we're gonna to come back to that in just a few minutes. But, uh, I want you to be thinking about gifts, and it's kind of a fun way to think about it, and we'll, we'll find some value in those props here in a few minutes, but, you know, the, the Bible has a lot to say about gifts. Gifts are, are, are a big deal. And in the chapter we read today, in chapter 12, Paul says, Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. That is what you just read, and I just read it again, but redundancy is critical. So listen again. He says, We who are many form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. Just think about that for a minute. Look around. You go, you look around. I mean, there's there's a there's a fair number of people in this room. And this is just one of three services. The next service is, is crazy, kind of packed. And this this is what he's saying is like, there, there's a lot of us, but we're one body. And in Colonial, that's especially confusing, isn't it? Because we have three services here, and then we have another campus over there, and there's two services over there. How is it that, that we're one body? Does that really ring true with you? You know, Christ's prayer for us in, in John 7 was, uh, John 17, that we would be one. And so Paul says, you are one. You are many, but you're one. You're one body. You know what Paul's doing? He's painting a picture of what the early church looked like. He describes the early church as a place where their deep commitment to each other was was their salvation. It was the means by which they they, uh, were able to withstand the persecution because following Christ in the early church is very costly. Then Luke describes the early church again in the second chapter of Acts, verse 44. He says, they were all together and they had everything in common. You see, they found hope, strength, and protection in being together. They were more likely to survive persecution if they united as one, sharing what they had for the greater good of the community. Paul says it this way, each member belongs to all the others. So like it or not, as the church, you belong to me, and I belong to you. We are as interconnected and interdependent as the liver and the heart and the brain. Which one of those organs would you like to do without? You remove any one of those organs and you're dead. That's the picture. That every believer is interconnected and interdependent. And you are as vital to me as a heart or a liver or a brain is to my body. Now... As a body of believers, we're all entrusted with certain gifts. And, and in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul states, Now about spiritual gifts, I do, I do not want you to be ignorant. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Again, just think of the props. I mean, these things are so very, very different. But they're all gifts and given in the same Spirit. Th- this is the idea about the body. We are very, very different but there's a spirit that binds us together. And these gifts are the means by which the spirit is made manifest and binds us together as one. And then he says this, Now to each one the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. All right, so here's where we're going. 
Just write this down, a little flow chart, right? We are a body of believers who belong to each other, like a body composed of different parts. So here's the metaphors developing, the body, body of different parts, but we all have a unique function. We all understand that. We're not all ears or nose or eyes. We have different functions. First, uh, next step is your function is the implementation of your spiritual gift. So it's not just that you play the piano or that you serve as an usher. The implementation of you as part of the body is that you use your spiritual gift. And we're going to come back to that. And then four, the use of the spiritual gifts is for the common good of the body. So it's not just a matter of, of using your gift in order to you know, serve humankind or or try to be a productive citizen, you're vital to the common good of this body. Each of us has been blessed with a specialty, a God-given gift that is intended for the common good of the body and its mission. Throughout the scriptures, we learn of a myriad of different kinds of spiritual gifts. I'm going to give you a spattering right quick. We'll come back to this in a minute. But faith, giving, serving, leadership, discernment, administration, healing, teaching, wisdom, knowledge, prophecy, and there are more. These are all listed throughout the scriptures as spiritual gifts. And if you are a believer, here's the deal. You have a spiritual gift. You may not think that you have a spiritual gift. You may compare yourself to other people and say, I I don't have any spiritual gifts compared to that person or this person. But the hard, cold fact is the guaranteed promise is if you are a believer, you have a spiritual gift. You really do. And not just that you have one, but God intends for you to use it for the common good. Now, how how do you determine what your spiritual gift is? I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. We have an instrument prepared for you on your way out today that may help you to identify what your spiritual gift is. Now, please do not confuse a spiritual gift with a talent or a skill. This is where sometimes we get confused, don't we? Because we think that a spiritual gift, we start talking about gifts, we're talking about music, or we're talking about the ability to preach, or to teach Sunday school, or, or whatever. Just because I can juggle, or make people laugh, or sing, or, or shoot a basketball, doesn't mean that that's a spiritual gift. A spiritual gift is a product of God's grace, given freely so that we might fulfill our role within the body of Christ. Okay, that, That's kind of a definition that you can take to the bank. A spiritual gift is a product of God's grace, freely given so that we might fulfill our role within the body of Christ. You know, lots of people confuse that. Um, Paul says that the gift is actually the manifestation of Christ's spirit. So how are people going to know that Christ is in you? How does the spirit work through you? The spirit will work through your giftedness. God never calls you to do something that he has not gifted you to do. So if it scares you to think about going to Africa, and you think, you know, if I really become serious about my faith, he's going to make me sell everything I have and go to Africa or, or Haiti or someplace, you would only be called to do that if you were gifted to do that. Okay? It's so important that you realize that God's not calling you to do anything he has not gifted you to do. It is actually the manifestation of Christ's spirit living in you, that is your spiritual gift. So when we're using our spiritual gifts for the common good of the body and its mission, here's the test. When we're using our gift, people will see Christ in us. When all of us are using our spiritual gifts, people will see Christ in us as individuals and us as a corporate body of Christ, as colonial. That's so, so critical People will not just see Christ by coming to a worship service and watching worship leaders and a pastor. It's vital that we are functioning as a body, using our gifts for them to be able to see Christ in us. Let's, uh, let's go back to my props for just a minute. Let's say I have the, the spiritual gift of knowledge. And uh, I'm going to equate that to a bag of M&M's. Just stick with me. Um, You know, uh, knowledge is one of those things where it's it's a wonderful gift. God God spiritually gifts you to be one of those people like Jeff who can memorize entire chapters of the Bible. I can't even remember my name. Uh, 
But you, you have this vast well of knowledge and you can accumulate data and you can reproduce it. And you know what? If you just kind of let that gift be all about you and that you just kind of devour that gift, you become one of those people that we don't like very much. You're a know-it-all. You're smarter than everybody, and you like to tell everyone how smart you are. But the spiritual gift of knowledge is designed to be used for the common good, for you to play your role within the body. And so you may play any number of positions uh, within the system of a call the church of empowering people with knowledge. So there's a difference between just being able to consume it for yourself or have such a rich gift and share it for all. That's just, a, just kind of a silly illustration, but I wanted you to, to realize that, that these gifts are so different, but we're meant to use them. You know, think about, think about this chainsaw. I, I think of um, the spiritual gift of leadership because chainsaws are dangerous and leaders are dangerous. Leaders will lead regardless of whether they think they're leading or not. And the way that they wield this thing can either create... Uh, you know, great value and, and, and can do tremendous tasks or it, it can really just cut the legs right out from underneath people. So something like this, a leader always needs to be sharpening his tool, always needs to be uh, making adjustments, always needs to be very, very careful about, they wield, about the way they yield, uh, wield that spiritual gift. But it's a great, great spiritual gift and it's, it's one that is intended to be used not sat around and collect dust. And then, uh, you know, I think of maybe the, the spiritual gift of service, kind of like a guitar. You know, a lot of us feel like we might would have the spiritual gift of service, but to do so, to actually implement it and use whatever God has called and gifted us to do through this spiritual gift of service, it's going to take some practice. One of the things I hear people say is, well, I tried that and I failed and I, don't, I just don't think I'm good at it, so I'm not going to go and keep trying to, you know, make a difference working with the homeless or serving in Sunday school or all the things that, that maybe somebody with the spiritual gift of service could be doing. It's going to take practice and it's probably going to cause you some pain initially. But at the moment when you strike a chord, you know, on, 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 on a very tuned guitar... God is going to make music through your life. People are going to see Christ in you, and it's going to be worth the time and energy that you put into practicing and disciplining yourself. A tool like this, is just, it's going to take some time for it to develop. So please don't expect that, that it's always going to come easy. In fact, I think most of the kingdom purposes don't come easy, but it's worth it. So... We have these spiritual gifts where we're intended to use it, but then we have this reality right here, the unopened gift. And, and you know, if I'm stepping on you, that's okay, I mean to. Because if, if you think that being part of the body of Christ is all about you, all about serving you, feeding you, entertaining you, that you're getting a little bit better than your neighbor, ethical, you know, triumphalism, that may be your religion, but it has absolutely nothing to do with the body of Christ. It's impossible for us to be believers and be ungifted. And it's really impossible for us to be disciples of Christ, followers of Christ, and keep this thing in the box. Now, unlike this gift which is really just another box to move from South Carolina to Kansas, your gift is vital. It says in, in the scriptures that, that we're interdependent, that we belong to one another. You know what that means? It means that my kids need for you to use your gift. This community is desperate for you to use your gift, and I need to use my gift for you. And when we drop the ball and we, we leave our gifts in the box, it does damage to the body. It's a big deal. Now, many of you 
are my age or younger, especially in the next couple services. And our, our, our generation is famous for saying, well, why join a church? It's not a country club. What benefit do I get from being a member of a church? Well, this is the difference. This is one of the critical differences. Membership of a church means that you are part of the body, that, that you have accepted Christ, committed your life to him, and you are now a right arm or, or an ear or an eye. You're a vital part of the body. Church attenders or attendees are people who come to, to be fed or to see and maybe to contemplate, and we are so glad that you're here, but at the point when you make the commitment to be a member of the church, you enter into this relationship of, of interdependency, that we love you, that we need you, that you're vital to the body, and that God has given you a gift, a special role to play here. So that's one of the big differences in, in the way that I answer that question. So how can I know what my spiritual gift might be? There are some spiritual gift inventories that I've asked to be uh, made available for you as you leave here today. It's just a little instrument, but I think if you take it and you do so prayerfully, you'll probably find a pattern through that instrument that will help you to understand this is where my gift is. I think God desires for us to know what our gifts are, and that's a, just a small instrument that you can use to find out what, what your gift is. Now, my message this morning and the last two weeks have really been devoted to the church. And that's because we're in a, a season of stewardship. And what that means is that we're, we're reminding you and, and coaching you and teaching you again that to be part of the body of Christ is to be faithful with your life, all that you have with your time, with your gifts. Next week, we move into a very, you know, probably uncomfortable conversation for some of us, but one that's vital and often found in the Bible, and that's being faithful with our finances as well. We're going to jump right into that. I wanted to warn you. <laughs> But, but I really think you'll enjoy that time, and, and it'll be a time that God will speak. But I also realize, and I was thinking about this last night, that, uh, that there's probably some good folks here this morning who are not part of this body. In fact, you're probably not part of anybody or any church because you've never quite been able to grasp this whole faith, religion, church thing. And if you fit that description... I want you to know I'm so pumped that you're here this morning. I've been praying for you, and I'm just so excited that you're here. And I've, I have a few thoughts for you too, whoever you are. First of all, I want you to know that, that I don't know all the answers to your questions. I'd be a fool to say that I do. But this is what I believe in light of everything we've been talking about, that we are not accidents that you were created to make an eternal impact in this life. But we all mess it up, every one of us. The guilt and shame that we experience is universal. Just as, just as sure as the seasons will change, we're, we're going to drop the ball and mess it up. But then Jesus Christ, who I'm sure you've heard of, comes onto the scene. You see, God makes things right for you and for me while we're still screw-ups, by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to the earth. Christ is a historical fact. Nobody really argues that. And his young life has shaped the course of history more than any other life ever. His death is documented, but so is his resurrection. He is alive. I think right now, in this moment, if you search your hearts, I think God will reveal himself to you and, and you'll know that he is alive. The cross was the central point of history. The mystery of the cross, and it is a mystery. But it's articulated throughout the New Testament. And, and, and in a nutshell, here's what it says. That we are forgiven. We can't earn it, own it, or sell it. But Christ died to set us free. I believe that with all my heart, and that's called grace. Grace. The Apostle Paul says that Christ made reconciliation with God possible. What that means, in other words, is that we've been made right with God through the blood of Christ. We're restored. We're back to being useful for eternity. The game is on. God will accomplish great things through each of us as we grow in our willingness to trust him with our lives and serve with the gifts, these special gifts we've been talking about that have been 
given to us for the common good of, of being part of a body, a community, like Colonial. And we have a mission, and you're part of that. And what is our mission? Well, we want to change the world. That's, that's what I'm about. I want to be part of feeding the hungry and telling the truth, challenging injustice, saving our environment, reclaiming our families, distributing hope to the hopeless. And what doesn't sound awesome about that? So receiving God's grace begins with a confession of our messed upness and accepting God's costly gift of grace as demonstrated by Christ on the cross. And when you get that grace, when it hits you, you'll want to follow the one who sets you free. And I want to tell you, it's more, it's more like letting go than it is achievement. It's more like um, coming home than any great departure because I believe every one of us was created to be in fellowship with God. And, and Christ makes that possible for us all. And you may question why God would want you. And I think a lot of people question about that. You know, we always say that, that this, this transformation begins with a humble prayer. And you may ask the question, well, <laughs> why would God listen to me? I can relate with that question. The Bible tells us that Christ stands at the door of our hearts and, and knocks. He's knocking now, and, you know, I suspect he, he always has been. So the invitation is not to step out of who you are. The invitation is to allow Christ to step in. The big lie is that you've got to get your life all right and everything straight before you can be part of this church body. If, if anybody here has your life all straight, would you please stand up? <laughs> I mean, we, we, are, we are a body of broken people, aren't we? This, this is not a museum for the saints. It's a hospital for sinners. But the promise is that Christ comes into our lives and he begins to clean house. He changes us from the inside out. And he replaces our brokenness with a gift, a spiritual gift that will lead to you and to me having a part to play in eternity, in, in what's happening here in the kingdom of, of God that is actually being developed. God's doing things right here, and we get a chance to be part of that, and that's, that is such an honor. As a believer, you become part of the great body called the church, and friends, the church is still the hope of the world. So for those of you ready to respond to the gentle knocking of Christ that is happening in your life this morning, if there's even one, I would like to conclude our service with a simple prayer, and I invite you to say it along with me this morning. And for those of you who are believers, would you please pray for that one person this morning and also be convicted of God's call upon your life to use your gifts that we can advance his kingdom here. Will you pray with me? God, it's me. I know that I've been distant, maybe even defiant. I confess that my life is a mess without you. I've done and said things that are wrong, but the things that I've left undone are probably worse. I'm not sure what I believe, but I need you to make this real for me. I need to know that you're listening that the knocking on my heart is Christ. I need to be forgiven and washed clean. I need a new heart. Release me from the slavery of my fears and my past so I can be a player in eternity. Help me to find some answers for the questions that plague me. But in the meantime, help me to have faith even in the midst of my doubts. Please help me to share my new faith with someone here today just to tell them about what's happening in me, though the mere thought of talking about this scares me. I don't want to be religious, God, but I do want to be used by you to change the world I live in, beginning with my own. Thank you for loving me even when I denied you. Thanks for loving me like a mother and a father love their tender children. Thanks for sending your child to die in my place. Thanks for this group of people here. You might just be my family. 
Help me to change so I can help change the world. I'm ready for a new life. And please make this stick. Make it real for me. Amen.